if I could call the meeting to order, honestly. At least this evening I have all my panellists. At lunchtime in this room I only had two out of four at this point. So thank you all very much for, for, for coming uh, to this meeting, um, which is about the interesting, perennially interesting subject of electoral reform. <laughs> Um, but after the May general election result, clearly there's much to discuss because the uh, result was so dramatic in its mismatch between how the House of Commons looks and how the people voted. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, four fantastic, uh, three fantastic panellists, four with me, obviously, um, uh, to discuss this. Um, if, as, as you're listening, what we'll do is we'll have... Each of the panellists give their uh, exegesis of where we are and how reform could be helped along by uh, alliances acro across the parties and including people of no, of no party allegiance. And then we'll open it up to the floor for questions. Um, if any of you are, are, are Twitterites, uh, the hash hashtag for this event is ERS Fringe and, of course, LD Comp for the whole conference. Um, and obviously, since we're hoping to get as many people in involved as possible in this sort of movement, uh, to Twitter, Twitter helps very, very much. The microphone on. Uh, the microphone is on, I believe, but perhaps I should bring it closer. Yeah, we'll bring it. Can you all hear me at the back? Yeah. Okay. Great. So I'm. Should we move it? Okay. Um. I'm going to introduce our panellists and then ask them to speak for around six or seven minutes before we uh, open it up to questions. First of all, I'd like to introduce Owen Winter. Owen here um, is a member of the UK Youth Parliament, uh, representing North and East Cornwall. Um, and at the age of 16, he's already very experienced in uh, getting people together for popular support for this issue because he launched a petition which got over 230,000 signatures in just a few days on fair votes. Um, and he is also now on the Council of the Electoral Reform Society. And we're also joined by Catherine Trebek, who uh, works for Oxfam's research team as the global research and policy advisor in that team. Um, and she also has considerable uh, experience of cross-party alliances in putting together the Humankind Index in Scotland, which was involved all parties and none. So hopefully she can talk to us a bit about uh, you know, advice on that in this age of tribalism. Um, Katie uh, probably needs no introduction from me. You all know her well. She has been the chief exec of the Electoral Reform Society since 2010. So she's lived through this interesting period of uh, experimentation with coalition and now, now back to majoritarian government. And um, she has a long career in the third sector before that. Uh, we were also hoping to have with us today um, Stephen Kinnock, uh, of that great Labour dynasty, uh, who is now the MP for Aberavon, but unfortunately he was he was unable to to make it to the meeting. But he has sent a message, uh, his thoughts on on this this particular campaign, which I believe Katie is is hoping to sh to share to share with us. Um, so um, we'll start in a second after the meeting. If you're all fired up about this subject, there is actually another <laughs> meeting on electoral reform straight afterwards, um, which is in the Connaught Hotel, where a pamphlet is being launched by Martin Linton and Make Votes Count uh, about STV and some very interesting sort of maps and data with that. So please do move on to that if you if you feel enthused by our, by us. Um, but I'd like to open up uh, with Owen. Owen, if you could give us your insights into this question of where we are with building alliances for electoral reform, given that we have a majoritarian, a majority government, uh, which at the moment seems to have no interest in it and no reason to be interested, perhaps. Um, yep, so as you just heard, I am the elected member of the Youth Parliament for North and East Cornwall. And I couldn't vote in this general election, but I could see that first past the post failed voters. As someone who's only just started getting involved in politics, our system made absolutely no sense. How could it be that one party got nearly 4 million votes and one seat, whilst another got less than 2 million votes and 56 seats? So uh, what was I going to do about it? And in typical young person fashion, I started an online <laughs> petition, um, which has since had 235,000 signatures. Uh, my petition was handed to David Cameron as part of a collection of names um, of 477,000 by representatives of the five political parties that support electoral reform from across the political spectrum. It's not often that uh, parties put aside their differences 
and work together, but what unites those half a million people and you is that they all feel the injustice of First Past the Post. Um, since my petition, I set up the Voting Reform Team Facebook group, which is a group of over 4,000 people working for electoral reform. Uh, they're just ordinary people, most of whom have never been involved in a political campaign before, but together um, we organised the Great Gathering for Voting Reform, a demonstration outside of Parliament which attracted around 1,000 around attendees, uh, attendees from all different parties. It was great to see Liberal Democrats Simon Hughes and Tom Brake uh, sharing a platform with activists from UKIP, the Green Party, Labour and even the Conservatives. <laughs> Um, I was really keen to get involved with the Electoral Reform Society and last month I was um, elected to the Society's Council, which was a great honour. Um, I come from a marginal constituency, North Cornwall, and the general election there was a straight race between a Conservative and a Liberal Democrat. And on May the 8th it was announced that the Conservative candidate had secured 45% of the vote and was elected. For a majority of the voters in my constituency, this was a disappointment. It wasn't just the Liberal Democrats who'd lost out on that day. For those who voted for the Green Party, UKIP, Labour or our own party, Mevi and Kerno, this result was unsurprising but disappointing. Many people in North Cornwall were forced to vote tactically or did not vote at all and now they are unrepresented. From across the political spectrum and across the country, support for electoral reform has surged. Labour voters who have never considered electoral reform before are now questioning the system that left them with only four MPs in the South West. Conservative voters who voted no in the AV referendum now wonder whether it's fair that they only got one MP in Scotland. A recent poll published by the Electoral Reform Society showed that the majority of voters from every major party support changing our voting system. Now is the time to take action, both within our own parties and on a broader scale, to put our voting system under the spotlight and raise electoral reform up the agenda. With a Conservative majority, the only way we can successfully campaign for electoral reform is if we look past our differences and work together regardless of political persuasion. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Um, Catherine, would you like to um, speak for us? Yeah, and sure. we are particularly interested in your experience of cross-party working. Okay. Is that working up the back there? Yeah, I'll do it right. So, so I'm Australian, and the Australian political system, I think, has probably many features you'd probably be quite envious of. Uh, we have an elected upper house uh, that is filled, yes. Yeah. Um, that, that is filled you know, pr proportionately, and our lower house is based on what we call preferential voting. But of late, the way we seem to choose MPs seems to be backroom party coups. Um, <laughs> if, <laughs> And even rather than any sort of more substantial electoral, electoral process or democratic process than, than that. And actually, there was a fire brigade in, in Australia that has recently put out a tweet saying, you need to check your smoke alarm every time Australia gets a new prime minister. <laughs> that was lovely. Uh, That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's a lesson in that. Um, but so I don't feel particularly qualified to talk really about sort of how you need to go about changing the mechanics of the electoral system. But what I do have a little bit of experience in is trying to work as collaboratively as possible across all sorts of different agencies and different political parties. And so I'm going to share just some, really some lessons that have come from that, just some things that seem to have worked for me. Uh, I'm going to present them in fairly generic sense, but I've got examples that I can give you across any of them. So if in, in the Q&A, if you want to dive deeply into any of those particular ideas or axioms, then, then do just, just shout out. So I want to look at across few, three different domains. One, sort of working together with sort of other NGO groups or other lobby groups or, or businesses, working particularly with the public and also with government as, a, sort of, as an agent of change. Uh, so in terms of working with each other, I guess one of the first things that, that comes to mind from the experience I've had is really vital to recognise and celebrate each, other, each other's strengths. Uh, 
rather than trying to do it all yourself. So recognise what each other brings to the party and, and work around that and tr seek to complement each other. Uh, and this also then means if you're going to have a successful partnership, it means focusing on those big picture issues that you share. Don't try to have a, identical views on absolutely every single minutiae of, of an issue. Otherwise, you just may as well be the same organisation. So really focus on what it is you, that you share in terms of one big question or one big commonality issue, uh, rather than trying to clone the detail of each other. And I guess related to that is relax about who gets the credit. You know, this isn't like a, the end of a movie where they list and itemise every single tiny, tiny little job. Just really sort of celebrate the wins rather than trying to sort of claim any particular function or particular attribution. Uh, and I guess the other aspect working with each other that I'd say probably applies across many different areas is have fun because it's those sort of relationships, it's the people rather than the paperwork that will get you through those inevitable tough times, those times when you're stressed or you're resource poor or you're time poor and where you're sort of really up against it, trying to make decisions in the heat of the moment. And unless you're having fun along the way and you've got good relationships with each other, then it's not going to work because every partnership ultimately stands or falls on the quality of those personal relationships. You can have all the memorandums of understanding, you can have all those agreements written down on paper, but unless you're getting on and working well together, then they're not worth what they're written on. So, so there's some ideas for working with each other. In, in terms of working with the public, now I'm, I'm a student of deliberative democracy, so it goes without saying that I think there's a huge sort of important role for public involvement in and of itself. So that, just part, that goes without saying. But involving the public is also very instrumentally important in terms of getting, getting to objectives <coughs> because it's, I think it's really important to avoid those moments where Sir Humphrey might, might have warned his minister, that's very brave minister. And then, of course, of course, no action happens because no, no, no politician really wants to be brave. So what we need is the public to be there ahead, ahead of any change so that the politician feels they're stepping into a, a space that's already laid out for them. And so that comes down to being really proactive. Don't just open up the gates and expect everyone to be there. You really need to reach out to your constituency understand them, understand where they have their conversations, where people meet and engage, but also understand the barriers to people's participation. Because, and we've, we've seen this up in Scotland recently with a, a bill called the Community Empowerment Bill. If you just open up the doors, then who's going to be at the front of the queue? It'll be people with resources. And then you'll understand why, why are there more inequalities? Why, why are certain groups not engaging with this? So really take the time to understand the barriers that certain groups face in terms of participation and do absolutely everything you can to address those barriers and proactively reach out to people. Uh, and I guess this is quite a challenging one because we're in a world where everyone wants to focus on quick wins, but I'd say try to hold the long term. Try to really focus on the, the long term goals, the long term sort of system change or transformation, but also that means focusing on intrinsic pursuits as well. Uh, and I can come back to what, what I mean by this perhaps in, in Q&A. Rather than being too opportunistic in focusing on quick wins by playing to people's extrinsic values. So really focus on the moral case rather than just caving in for, to what might be all too easy to, to achieve quick wins. And that's to do with how you frame issues, why you present something. Don't just rely on some sort of business case. You know, focus on what hearts and minds say. Focus on the moral, moral reasons behind what you're pursuing. And in terms of government, I guess for the experience, particularly with the, the Humankind Index in Scotland, is that having a champion, not just in one party, but in each and every party, was really, really important. So again, it comes back to those individual relationships that I've already mentioned. Find those individuals, furnish them with the material and the information and the cool quotes that they, that they need to go and make the running for you. Uh, so that, that's really key. Also, in, in a similar way, it's another vehicle, is use trusted sources to present your message. So it's not just coming from you. So we were able to use the you know, Parliamentary Information Unit. We were able to use other agencies like unions or the churches to <coughs> present the message that we wanted to get across. So when you have that sort of all the, these similar messages coming from different sources that are trusted and listened to, 
then it starts to make sense and starts to become really compelling. And, and finally, be sort of atheist and agnostic at the same time about party politics. So be apolitical and cross-party at the same time. Don't, the, the worst thing that could happen is for an issue to become the baby of one particular party to the exclusion of the others. Because a really good idea will just be kicked around and kicked into touch um, be, as a political football. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, but really happy to share with you some examples and some more sort of concrete um, thinking behind those points. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and finally, I'm going to ask Katie to bring us a message from Stephen Kinnock and also to give us her own views on where we are with the idea of making some sort of cross-party, all-party, no-party uh, campaign for electoral reform work. Katie. Great, thank you. Can you all hear me at the back? Yeah, great. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I want to, to, to share with you the statement from Stephen Kinnock and also to say he um, is really, really sorry he's not here. He was actually on his way here yesterday. There was a diary mix-up between his office and my office for which I take responsibility. He is passionate about proportional representation. Um, he really wants to make it happen. Uh, so I'm pleased that I, I'm able to kind of uh, share the statement with from him and hopefully we can sort of part of the discussion this evening will be very much about kind of cross-party platforms and it's been brilliant to have some of Catherine's insights and into that. So Stephen said, I'm very sorry that due to a logistical mix-up I'm not able to join you in Bournemouth this evening. The 2015 general election has shown the sheer mathematical absurdity of first-past-the-post into sharp relief. A system that enabled the SNP to win 95% of the seats in Scotland with just 50% of the Scottish vote, whilst yielding just one UKIP MP on the basis of 4 million votes, is simply not credible, and it leads to disenchantment with the democratic system. Moreover, our antiquated first-past-the-post voting system distorts our democracy, encourages an adversarial political culture, and it divides us along north-south urban-rural lines. We have to grasp the fact that an electoral system that leads to large parts of the country either being taken for granted as, as uh, safe seats or disregarded as lost causes is deeply pernicious because it has a direct influence on decisions about the distribution of investment and resources. And I've heard Stephen talk about um, the economy, actually, and inve where investment goes and how he feels that the first-past-the-post system really <coughs> contributes to that situation. So the case for radical reform of our electoral system should be based on the fact that it has a direct and vitally important relationship with real economic and social outcomes. If we can shape the debate so that the British people come to understand the way in which First Past the Post has a direct influence on their everyday lives, then I believe that a future referendum on electoral reform could be won. Um, and then he, he goes on to say, we also need electoral reform because it's imperative that we start to build a more deliberative political culture, as, as Catherine suggested, that's designed to deliver much needed improvement to the quality of our decision making processes by building consensus and co cooperation. Um, I apologise once again for the fact that I was not able to join you this evening, but I hope that you have a fruitful discussion and I look forward to receiving the debrief and I wish you success in your campaign on this vitally important issue. So a really kind of strong, strong message from Stephen. Um, um, yeah, let's do this again next year and I'm, he'll be able to be here in person. I just thought I'd take the opportunity, if Stephen's not here, just to... Uh, share s sort of a few developments really kind of hot off the press from having been on the road already with conference party conference season I don't know about all of you but I feel there has been a profound sea change in public attitudes and political attitudes since the general election in May this year when it comes to electoral reform there are now more long-standing supporters of the status quo who are welcoming the idea of a debate. They are saying that something has, has changed. Yesterday I was chairing our event at the Cooperative Party Conference and the Labour peer, uh, George Fawkes, Lord Fawkes was there and he actually said, I believe I've been called a, a dinosaur in the past by the Electoral Reform Society for my views, you know, sticking up for first past the post. Um, he said he felt we were moving closer together he is querying his position. He said, I recognise there are many electoral systems in use in the United Kingdom. I cannot ignore that. 
Um, he really doesn't like the, the European NIST system. And he said, I absolutely think we need a debate. And um, is that open, there is a new open mindedness from people who cannot ignore what we have all felt passionately for years, but other people are beginning to say the world has changed and we need to have a debate about this. It, it's really exciting. The other thing that happened this week is that myself and, and other colleagues, including our, our ERS Scottish director, Willie Sullivan, were at the Trade Union Congress conference. And how many of us here bear the scars of the AV referendum, where many of the trade unions um, stuck up for, for first pass of the post? Well, how remarkable is this? The Trade Union Congress passed a motion calling for their council to conduct independent research into electoral systems and to have an open debate about changing the electoral system. <laughs> absolutely amazing. And, and my colleague Willie and I sort of were, were standing in the Brighton Centre and the motion had just been passed. We couldn't quite believe it. We were looking at a very, very kind of stormy sea and we were just... Um, couldn't quite believe what had just happened actually. Uh, some of the unions spoke for the motion, some of them spoke against, but every single person, and this happened at our fringe meeting at the lunchtime as well, were having an open debate. They were saying this is a debate that we need to, to have, absolutely fantastic. Frances O'Grady, the General Secretary, um, made an important speech. She said she was going to support the motion, which had been put forward by the PCS union and seconded by the Probation Officers Union. And she said um, there are important concerns about the electoral system that when just 24% of those entitled to vote, that is not a resounding uh, mandate that they have. And she said, political parties chase swing voters to the detriment of others and broader political debate. It, the time is right to commission independent research, but we mustn't preempt the outcome. It's right that we're having the debate. So at the Electoral Reform Society, and again, this is something perhaps we could discuss this evening, we've got this avenue, we've got this opportunity now. Think of all those trade union members, think of the, the trade union commentators we can now have an open debate about and, and persuade them of the, the case. So that's a real like minds to change minds moment for me. And then uh, finally, uh, and one of the things we're going to be doing to follow up that at the ERS is, is chairing a meeting with senior trade unionists um, in November to really sort of take that discussion forward. And finally, on other aspects of our cross-party work, I'm excited to say that as well as holding our own fringe at, at the UKIP conference, I've been invited to speak on the main stage uh, about political reform, and I've been given a 20-minute <coughs> slot to talk about STV, and, um, <laughs> which, which is going to be absolutely great. And what's important about that is the UKIP conference are having a motion that afternoon, it's next Saturday, on electoral reform. Now, the, you'll probably all know that the senior leadership of UKIP have actually been very passionately pro-electoral reform for, for a long time. Nigel Farage and others have really gone out there and, and supported it. But actually, I think a lot of the membership of UKIP are, are status quo. You know, conservative as they want to hang on to the status quo. So it's a real educational opportunity. I'm going to have some slides talking in quite straightforward terms about, you know, the, the beauty of STV and, and why it's a good system. And then uh, Douglas Carswell and Mark Reckless and others are, are going to be going to be talking as well. And they're, they're very pro uh, fairer voting. So how about that for, for two amazing opportunities like Minds to Change Your Minds, trade unions, members of UKIP, other parties as well. So I think there's real kind of energy and excitement there. Um, we, I mean, we all know being an electoral reformer, uh, as Catherine has said, it, it, it is long term, isn't it? And we have to be optimists. And it's a good thing I'm a born optimist um, running an organisation with this long term goal that's really, really, it's not something, it's not a quick when we can't achieve it overnight. But I feel really energised by the openness that some die-hard supporters of the status quo are now expressing that willingness to have a debate. And there's also something here about this um, surge of enthusiasm for public involvement in constitution making and um, uh, John Trickett at the Labour Party and others and, and the Liberal Democrats have been fantastic on talking about a constitutional convention and in a sense you, you, people can't have it both ways, they can't say we want to have a public debate about something and oh by the way I've already made up my mind first past the post is the right one so I think there's a really interesting synergy of that sort of desire for public involvement in decision making and, an op and how we can kind of all grab that. So, and, and of course, that whole, the whole public in, involvement um, appetite has been really kind of turbocharged when we saw the fantastic involvement that practically the whole Scottish population had as well. So uh, that's kind of got rid of any doubts that somehow people can't be trusted with, with the, the, the future shape of our, our democracy or can't be trusted to debate it. So I'm, I'm filled with energy and renewed optimism that when it comes to electoral reform, it's when, not if. And we've just got to put our heads together, put together the best possible 
um, kind of multi-pronged strategy with all the brilliant principles that Catherine's given to us and all of Owen's inspiration. Um, so yeah, looking forward to the, the questions and the debate. Thank you, Katie.